Um, all right, so uh, hello guys, uh, very, very nice to meet all of you. Uh, so you guys are watching from both uh, Beirut and uh, Barcelona, right? Okay, yeah, I can see the feed from uh, Barcelona. So <laughs> I, I was there at IAC, uh, just a month ago, actually. Uh, I was there uh, to teach a, a workshop at MacMill on C scripting and plugin development for, uh, for Grasshopper. And I actually spent like um, an afternoon uh, at IAC uh, sizing around. Uh, it was quite interesting what you guys did there, so I, I hope to come back there again at some point. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay. Can you can you get your microphone a little bit closer? So, all right. Can you still hear me? Now now it's way better. One, two, three. Yes, yes, better. Ah, okay, all right. Yeah, I'm, I'm using um an an. See, an, I see microphone, so, Okay, I will try. So, can you see my screen now? Okay. So, I'm going to put on the mic. All right. I just restarted my computer, so let me let me put on so All right, can you see the um, slides? Um, are you guys still with me? I mean, I can't hear from you, so it's difficult for me to know if you are uh, still with me or not. We are with you. I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt you if we cannot hear you. So I mean, we just want to be silent while you ah. talk. So that's why I'm gonna. Ah, okay, I understand. Microphone. Okay, I understand. All right. You can go on. Yeah. Long? Uh, yes, uh, my my main screen just turned off. So I thought I would show. Sorry. I mean, we see your screen, and do you have any technical issue? No, it's fine. I'm still with you. It's just that I, I, I'm on like two calls at the same time, so I'm gonna uh, rejoin the call uh, for my computer now. Just hang on a second. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm turning it now. Okay. Can you see the screen now? Can you, can you hear me and see the screen? I don't think I can hear you guys anymore, so let me try to something just to sure that. Can you still hear me? Uh, we can hear you and we can hear you. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm 
Sorry, sorry guys for the um, technical problems. Okay. Anyway, so um, the talk today that I want to like bring to you guys is titled Beam and Computation Toward the Convergence of the Two Major Trends. So before I start, let me uh, briefly um, talk about my myself and how I uh, came to the field of uh, architecture and computation. So um, actually, my background is in computer science, um, but I uh, so I actually study computer science in uh, at uh, Cambridge even though I was born and grew up in Vietnam. So I, I had a bachelor's degree in uh, computer science at Cambridge, and then I uh, moved on and uh, studied computer graphics at uh, UCL. And I've been brought up in a family where everyone except me are architects, so I've always have, like, received strong influence in architecture from uh, like my family. Um, so after I, I, I finished my uh, education, I actually started to kind of engage in architecture industry, mostly like developing plugins for uh, beam workflows and do beam consultancies. Um, and at some point, I actually engaged as a one of uh, Zahadid projects uh, um, do complex geometry modeling for um, the Grand Theater in uh, Rabat in Morocco. And after that project, I kind of realized that there is um, a kind of a demand or a lot of opportunities for um, um, a common scientist uh, like me to join the uh, architectural research and industry. And so in 2014, I joined the Institute for Computation Design, uh, commonly known as uh, ICD, uh, which is an institute uh, for computational design research at uh, the University of Stuttgart. And uh, since I joined in 2014, I've been uh, involved in many researches and teaching activities. So I, um, I, I, I'm i in charge of teaching uh, computational uh, design thinking. Well, I co-teaching computational design thinking. I, um, I lead the teaching of c -sharp scripting and plugin development uh, for Grasshopper. Um, and um, last April, I um, collaborate. I actually went to Barcelona and did a commercial training workshop uh, with uh, MacNew in Barcelona on a topic of C# -sharp scripting and plugin development. And that, that was a trip where I actually paid a visit to uh, IAC and got to know the people there. So um, I'm very pleased that um, the Global Summer School uh, reached out to me and uh, gave me an hour to uh, do this presentation. So um, today's talk, in today's talk, I'm going to talk about like uh, uh, three main uh, topics. First, um, like the beam trend in uh, the architectural design and research. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the uh, computation trends. And then I'm going to see how these two trends start to slowly converge. So um, in architecture recently, uh, it's difficult not to pay attention to these two trends. They have been developing quite independently and even divergent, uh, even in, a, in um, divergently. Um, mostly in the industry, people talk about beam all the time. Uh, it's you know it's it's pretty difficult to find a job these days if you uh, don't have certain skill in like beam software. Uh, Why in the academic research, you should, uh, when people do not care about beam at all, will care more about, more about parametric modeling, complex geometry, and computational approaches. So I mean, these two trends have been developed by two relatively isolated worlds. But recently, um, they've started to come together, uh, thanks to like new emerging uh, platform like uh, Dynamo, for example. So um, I have been approaching these two trends from both industry and also from uh, academic researchers. So, um, I want to offer my own uh, observation and my own comments on uh, the convergence of these two trends and the kind of uh, questions that we need to address in the uh, upcoming years when these two trends, uh, two trends start to merge, when um, the computation trends start to spill into uh, the industry practice. 
Okay, so um, let's briefly touch on the BIM trend. So uh, I'm sure that uh, all of you like, know what Revit or BIM is in general. Um, I mean, back in 2010, it was still like a big buzzword, but now 2017, everybody like kind of Revit and BIM. And if you're confused about what BIM is, then well, don't worry. Uh, BIM is still an evolving thing. I, I mean, people who invented BIM, like, still, I mean, BIM is still being redefined and refined uh, every day. Um, because it's still, it is still an, an evolving thing. Um, it's getting more, the definition of BIM is getting more and more detailed. The, the philosophy of BIM uh, has been around for quite a while, but the actual implementation and what BIM should be like and look like or how it should be implemented is still being questioned and uh, redefined uh, every day. So, I mean, overall, BIM is just um, an attempt to use a computer technology to unify all of the um, architectural design practice together with other phases or other sections of the whole building life cycle. So uh, as architects, we tend to care mostly about the design parts, but uh, uh, BIM tried to bring the architects together with uh, other part of the industry uh, from management to documentation and to construction and operation and maintenance. Okay, so BIM does not really try to fundamentally change the architectural design part. It actually aims to make the same architectural design that we're so familiar with the 20th century more efficient, better documented, less wasted. Uh, so it's aimed to solve the problem in the entire uh, building industry rather than just tackling the fundamental architectural design uh, paradigm. So. And because of that, because whenever you tackle the whole industry, um, you normally have to adhere to a lot of standards. So most of the BIM software these days are pretty rigid and relies on extremely standardized workflow. And this workflow is built around the modern architectural design construction practice. And by modern, I mean the, the modern era of architecture that was pioneered by uh, Le Corbusier or Bill van der Rohe, where you know, the, the structural system is mostly consist of the beam and columns and the construction technologies is suitable for building skyscrapers for example so the whole current industry and enhanced beam uh, workflow is based around that kind of architecture the, the standard modern architecture of the 20th century so um, if you want to do something that is unconventional a bit different from the standard paradigm, standard modern architectural design um, or construction um, 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 paradigm, then it's generally pretty difficult. You have to write a lot of custom solutions uh, in order to make your favorite software or whatever work with that unconventional design. So um, this is why it's not unsurprising at all for uh, a certain kind of architecture studio like Star had it to have a difficulty when they try to uh, adopt BIM in a workflow. So, I mean, if you talk to people from Star Hadid uh, back in probably 2011 and 12, uh, most of them probably will like, really hate Revit. I mean, they don't want to use Revit, they just have to use Revit because their clients ask them to do. Uh, they almost don't have it, want, want to have anything to do with Revit because it doesn't suit to their own workflow or to their kind of architectural style. Uh, but um, so, but back in 2013, there was this one project called the Grand Theater of Rabat in Morocco. Uh, the client actually kind of encouraged them or even asked them to deliver the whole project in uh, BIM format. So um, I got an opportunity to be hired by the facade designer for this uh, project to work as um, a BIM consultant, a BIM modeling uh, consultant for the uh, facade of this particular building. So I'm going to briefly uh, walk you through the, this, this process so that you can see the, the problem and uh, eventually how we can solve it, uh, how, we, how we solve it back in 2013 and how we can potentially solve it in a more integrated approach in the uh, upcoming future. So the way we did it is, you know, uh, when you do freeform curve modeling, uh, you always need to have a freeform curve modeling software like Rhino and a parametric uh, uh, tool on top of that like Grasshopper. Um, so 
uh, the uh, our workflow back in 2013 is that we uh, come up with a shared model workflow between Rhino, Grasshopper, and Revit. And uh, this was made possible because we end up developing a suite of plugins, a suite of like code and scripts in order to make this whole process possible. This is not something that you, you get out of the box uh, from either software. So um, what we did is that the architect at Zaha did use a Rhino and Grasshopper to model the uh, form uh, of the building. So it's just standard raw surface modeling. And then the model would pass on to the Fasa designer, New Technique, uh, which is also a London-based company that is located pretty uh, close to uh, the Ben Zahadid Architect's office. And they did the panelizations uh, with some like uh, consultation and advice uh, from the main uh, architects uh, from Zahadid. So this part was entirely uh, done in Rhino uh, because only in Rhino and Grasshopper you can find the right tool to do only advanced uh, free from curve modeling. Uh, for example, uh, even though most software including Revit can do some sort of basic curve modeling, but if, if you want to do some advanced stuff like finding the intersection of two curved surface or projecting a curve on a curved surface or offsetting a curve on a curved surface, those are pretty advanced operators that can be only be found in software like Rhino, for example. So it's almost impossible not to, you know, to completely Rhino and move entirely and uh, move the entire modeling workflow into um, use the best of uh, of both worlds. So after. Um, the uh, facade designer did uh, the panelization in Revit. And here we uh, jump in and uh, I helped develop a suite of plugins that tr translate this geometry into Revit. So it's not um, a static uh, import, export and import of geometry. We want to actually reconstruct the panel geometry using native uh, Revit geometry so that we get a full benefits of a beam environment uh, workflow, for example. So what we did is its panels is a double curved surface. So we can approximate the surface by strate uh, strategically place sampling points along each curved surface. So for this particular quad panel, curved quad panels, for example, you can pretty accurately describe the shapes by just capture the six control points, four at the corners and two at the uh, longer edges here. Okay, so if you capture these points and somehow bring them over to Revit, you can reconstruct a pretty uh, closely similar shape to the Rhino, to the original version in Rhino. Okay, so we got the points, and each points are just x, y, z. Right, each point can be fully described by a bunch of x, y, z coordinates. And well, for modeling the thickness later on in Revit, we also need to capture the normal vector at each control point and also the tangent vector. So we can, and, and, and the normal and the tangent are just vectors, so they, again, can be described by three numbers. So everything can be easily translated or can be translated to Revit via some sort of text file. And here, so we we develop a, a Rhino plugin that take in a bunch of panels, like place the sampling point, extract the XYZ coordinates, the normal XYZ, and the tangents XYZ, and store them in a big, big XML file. So the XML file looks like this. So for those of you who don't know XML, XML is really just a text file. But you write a text file in a conventional and structured way, so it's easier for a human to read and easier to for to write a, a piece of script to, to parse or to process information because everything is so structured. The green panel you look here can be fully described using these text. So it's panel type. Uh, uh, this is a panel. The type is 2.3. So it has like 2.2 times 3 uh, control points. So there was uh, a typo here. It should be 2.3. And then we list our only control points um, of this panel. So here we have six control points. So this is the first control point. And its control point, you just like describe the 
XYZ of the uh, position, uh, the XYZ of the normal vector and the tangent vector. Okay, so this is how you fully extract information from Rhino and start it in a text file. And then uh, on the Ruby side, we develop a plugin that read in the information, the XYZ information, which are just numbers, with, uh, uh, which is start at text, so it's very easy to read in and to process. And then we use the XYZ actually recreate the geometry. So uh, for those of you who are, who are familiar with Revit, uh, Revit uh, allow you to create a parametric family. So here I have a parametric family that whose shape is fully defined by this uh, blue control point. So if we move the control points around, uh, the shape will change, for example. And um, instead, of, so normally in Revit, you place these control points manually. And that will determine the shape or the geometry of what is the geometry that is attached or dictated by these control points. Uh, but here, instead of like manually placing these control points into the main file, our plugin will do that. So it takes in the XYZ value from the from the XML file, and and for each panel, it's like generate a particular instance of this Revit family and place the, the these control points. Uh, which are called, actually called adaptive points in the Revit uh, terminology. So it's, great, it's um, the plugin will automatically place these adaptive points at the right XYZ coordinates. And everything is like pretty much automated. And then we end up with like uh, all the panels. Um, and in, so in Revit, we will model the thickness. So each panel actually has the thickness. And if you look at the, the, the inside phase of the panels, so, um, if you look at the, the image on the left, I don't know if you can see my mouse on the cursor, but uh, anyway, just look um, on the for, at the screenshot on the left. This is this show the inside face of its uh, panels, and inside you see that each panel doesn't have just a thickness, but it they have the ribs. Okay, so the ribs can be modeled by basically so we have a thickness, and then we have free negative thickness or like free uh, void solid according to Rubik's terminologies, and these voids will cut into the solid part. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> creating the free hollows geometry and leaving out the ribs. Okay, and, and the position of this uh, void geometry are uh, also controlled by the control point that we can extract it from uh, Rhino. So it's uh, pretty. Um, so it's actually worked. The, the workflow works, and we managed to like recreate like uh, almost four thousand, actually more than four uh, four thousand uh, glass reinforced concrete uh, double curve. Uh, panels in Revit, uh, the, the whole files actually end up being like 200 megabytes, which is actually quite large uh, for, a red, for, a red, uh, for a Revit file. But anyway, so uh, after this, we realized that um, doing unconventional design with BIM uh, requires a lot of uh, customized tools and, and workflow and solutions. And this involves a lot of programming and scripting and also a, a good understanding of computational geometries, especially like uh, curve and curved surface. And generally, this kind of workflow is no silver bullet. So for each project, you generally will have to adapt uh, the tool to suit that particular uh, project. So here in this project, we kind of know that the geometry is a double curve panel with thickness, and each of them have like a, like free void geometry to leave like um, to leave out the ribs. So we already know what it's like, so we kind of hard code a lot of things to make it easier. And after this thing, we also like ask ourselves a question, will the coding skill be a standard skill that every architect, or at least the new generation of architects are expected to know, or will it stay as some sort of like a, a niche skill that only a subset called the computation or parametric experts we know and each company or each studio will basically have a team of these experts that will help solve this technical problem, right? So that was back in 2013. So, uh, so that is like uh, the the beam trend I want to talk about. So the beam trends when it faced with unconventional design, it start to like face uh, some obstacles that could only be solved by like custom scripting or programming. So now let me uh, temporarily switch to you know, the computational trend. So 
this, this trend has also been developed independently, but also in, in parallel to the BIM trend in the industry. Okay, so uh, computational design trend is actually quite different from the BIM trends. I mean, they both, uh, I mean, to the people outside of the architecture field, uh, they look kind of similar because they both like relies on uh, the, the power of uh, digital computers. Uh, so um, they they might feel the same, but uh, they, they able to tackle different problems. So BIM tried to tackle the whole uh, efficiency problem of the whole um, design and construction and management in industry. Uh, computational design is mostly exclusive to the, the fundamental architectural design practice. So it aims to rethink the current architectural design methodologies by taking advantage of like digital algorithms from many different fields, like computational geometries, numerical simulations, physics simulation, agent-based modeling, and recently machine learning and other forms of artificial intelligence <coughs> in order to generate new architectural forms that arguably have better quality and performance by the existing architectural design. And by the existing architectural design, I mostly mean the modern architectural um, paradigm that was pioneered by the uh, modern architects uh, back in the early 20th century. Because um, arguably, um, this thing has been for, for quite a while. This thing has been here for quite a while. All of our construction technologies, all of the cranes, and all of the machinery that we see in the construction site nowadays were designed for this kind of construction where you can kind of mass produce um, components like window frames, you can mass produce like um, steel or rebar, and then bringing them to the construction site and use the machines to like build a pretty standard like um, kind of New York uh, kind of uh, building with glass cladding, for example. So these architecture were invented based on the available technology and material at the time, like steel and uh, modern uh, and, and, and mass production, for example. But now, uh, when moving to the 21st century, we have the digital computers, uh, we have new fabrication and construction uh, means like robots and additive manufacturing like 3D printing, for example. And so we want to see if these kind of new means of design and construction can bring about new type of architecture that better answer to the need of our society. Okay, So it's different from BIM because BIM the original like vision of BIM is mostly, or maybe not the original like vision of BIM, but at least the current implementation or practice of BIM is to make the same type of architecture that we've been doing more efficient um, to design uh, and more efficient to to manage and to exchange the information. It does not aim to fundamentally or rethink the very architectural design itself. So, um, also my PhD supervisor, Akin Menges, is uh, the editor of this um, pretty um, relatively old book now, Computational Design Thinking, where he, he kind of described the fundamental difference between computational design and computer, computer aid design. Um, so, you can read more about that to see the more like intellectual fundamental arguments, um, see why like computational design thinking. Um, more fundamental to, to 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 the modern architecture than, let's say, the general like uh, beam or or CAD uh, computer A design approach. So, in the academic research these days, uh, when you go to architecture school in other world, including EAC or University of Stuttgart or ETH Zurich or like, uh, Michigan University and many many uh, many, many other schools around the world. Also in the UK, the AA, uh, UCL, and many schools on the other side of the world, like um, like RMIT, and even these days, um, the Chinese University um, and even some Korea are really jumping on these um, highly uh, advanced uh, research. And if you look at all the themes that they are touching on, uh, they are generally centered around like digital fabrication, including 3D printing and robotic fabrication. 
um, additive manufacturing, so mostly 3D printing, uh, in both small scale and large scale, like uh, the concrete uh, 3D printing that ETH Zurich uh, is doing. Uh, and then on the poor design and geometric modeling part, we have generative design, parametric design, and in the um, German-speaking world, um, especially in Germany, uh, biomimetic design is like re really a big thing here. And if you look at that, the uh, the unifying theme or the unifying framework for all of these uh, all of these uh, sub themes in academic research is actually the digital uh, computers. So the digital computers offer the, the the ability to do computation, the ability to do algorithms. So you can bring about all of these different technologies. Uh, so, so um, at ICD, uh, we um, use computation in mostly in robotic constructions and biomimetic uh, design and generative uh, design. So let me um, like uh, show you uh, a few of um, our uh, previous um, researches. So every year, uh, we together with our partner institute, uh, the ITKE. Um, which is located also like in the same building. So the ITK is the, the Institute for Structural Design, and we are the and we are the ASD, the, the Institute for Computation Design. So we uh, uh, every year uh, together with the student from the, um, the ITEC Master Program, which is the master course at um, University of Stuttgart that is organized by the ICD and the ITK. So together we like uh, build a research pavilion, and each year we try to uh, tackle a different kind of. Uh, questions involve uh, generative design as well as like uh, robotic construction method. So the first one is actually not a research pavilion. This is actually um, a, a commission work uh, by uh, a city in the state of Baden-Württemberg uh, in uh, in southern Germany. <clears throat> so let me. Uh, maybe if you watch it from Google Hangout, the video quality will not be like uh, original. So, so anyway, um, in this project, uh, we were looking at like uh, how to rethinking the use of a wood architecture. So in Germany, more than fifty percent of uh, Germany is covered in in wood, and so we 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 try to see if like we how can we like use modern technology and design like generate design parametric modeling and agent-based modeling together with robotic construction in order to like uh, design and build uh, this, um, this structure. So the structure itself is uh, based or is inspired by the design of the uh, sand dollar, as you can see here. So the sand dollar gave us the idea of using the finger joints as the uh, way to connect the, 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 uh, the hexagonal plates. So the plates, we use the agent base uh, modeling method, as you can see here, to distribute the plates geometries on a double curved surface. This surface has a, like a peanut shape, so it has both the con the anticlastic um, region and the synclastic region. All right, so um, here we use the, C the standard CNC to like mew out the uh, piece of wood, and then we're gonna use we use the robot to mew out. This is like a six-axis mewing to mew out the finger joints. This was back in 2012, I believe, and uh, this is still in the early day of our research. So we use the, ro the robots for the fabrication, but the construction itself is still done by traditional methods. So it's still ha um, 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 using uh, humans with uh, cranes and some sort of foam works. So anyway, the robotic uh, uh, fabrication 
uh, this project is um, like um, a linear process. So you you have the geometry, you design the finger joints, and then the robot just like do the job like uh, without any feedback to the design. So this is a pretty standard linear workflow. Uh, now, uh, and then, now back to the research pavilion. So we actually started the research pavilion back in 2011, actually. But I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to start to show you um, uh, from 2014. So uh, apart from wood, uh, the other type of materials that we had actually have been looking at is, um, um, is uh, carbon fiber and glass fiber because they are really lightweight and they are it has great potential to uh, produce a lightweight structure. So here again, um, normally at every research, we start with some biomimetic idea. So, so the structure you're going to see here was inspired by the water spider. So the water spider, um, the, the water spider uh, live in the water, but it builds an air bubble so that it can live inside. And so our students uh, like film the uh, water spider to see how it's built and expand the uh, the water bubbles. And then we study the web structure, and we realize that it has like the main structure here, so like generally three layers: the main the structural components, and then the uh, rainfall glasses. So from that, we came up with a design where we inflate uh, a plastic membrane. Okay, so we inflate it and we use the air pressure to keep it like uh, standing and we, it will act as a foam work. And the robot will place inside uh, the bubbles and it will place a uh, fiber to the inside face of the bubbles. So obviously the side of the bubble itself or the side of the bubble itself has to be constrained by the reach of robots. So here we got sponsored by KUKA, so KUKA Lenners. The, uh, uh, the particular robot arm with the longest arm reach at that time. So the tricky, the trickiest part of this thing, of this project, is uh, we have to come up with a live feedback system to monitor the uh, the pressure along every single point of the uh, bubble, and then we update the design model uh, pretty much on the fly, and also. The, um, the robot path on the fly. Because as you place a fiber on the bubble, uh, it will slightly deform the bubble as well. So we need to like, always have a uh, real-time sensor to rescan the geometry and then update and regenerate uh, the next two path for the robot. Uh, so here at this stage, uh, the structure can stand on its own without relying on air pressure anymore. And eventually we can cut uh, out the opening completely. And then uh, from a membrane structure, from a tensile structure, uh, it becomes a compression. So this is um, the first project that we did completely on site. So the next, uh, in the following year, uh, we came back to uh, the wood material. Uh, so this one, uh, I had a chance to, persist, uh, to participate in uh, as a um, computational design tutor. So I tutored a group of students who developed a set of plugins for a rhino and grasshopper to model the uh, complex double layer, um, double layer components that make up the whole structure. So, <clears throat> so again, um, we we started. We always start with biomedic research. This time we uh, come back to the sand dollars and the sea urchins, which are actually two related uh, two related uh, species.
So based on the growth um, of the CO gene, we uh, mimic or we just approximate that process using a custom cross of a plugin. The double layers um, are kind of design and the finger joins, and the fact that we joins them by sewing uh, are owned by principles that we borrow from the CO gene. And here's the global design based on the growth. Um, on the growth process of the sea urchins. So after we got all of the uh, global design, we start to like triangulate it. And from each triangle, we can build a double layer component. Roll everything into like fast, into flat piece, and then we can like really uh, start to cut out using CNC. And this project, the robot actually did a pretty simple job. Uh, it just like take the whole piece and bring it to the industrial sewing machine. So compared to the other project, the robot movement in this one is like much simpler. So the robot just simply take the piece and try to align, try to align with the industrial sewing machine. So uh, again, this one, we use uh, robots for the fabrication part. But the construction part, uh, or the assembly part, was still done uh, using the conventional methods with like actual humans and, um, and, and, and the scaffolding system. So the thickness of the wood is only about like four to five millimeters. I, I don't remember the exact number, but it's really thin. But because we make it into a double layer, it has like enough structural strength to stay on its own. <coughs> uh, this is the latest um, research pavilion. So this one we combine two robots with a drone. So this time we went a little bit uh, like uh, crazy. So we decided to like have a cantilever structure, which as you know is one of the most challenging kind of structure to engineer and build. But we wanted to use it to showcase the uh, possibility when you actually bring in the drone, because the robot, while it's very accurate and precise, it, really cannot move much, but if you have two robots and then one drone in between that act as the material transport, uh, trans, uh, transportation, um, you can actually have um, a pretty uh, long-reaching structure like this one. So it was done in a robot lab with two robots and um, a drone that we like fully uh, developed, designed and built. So it was not a big drone, it was like a drone that we developed in-house uh, with like our own control system. Uh, so again, we started everything with biomedical research. At this time, our role model was spiders. <coughs> uh, sorry, I mean like take the pillar. That's fine. That, uh, what you see here is uh, the, the new uh, digital, uh, new computational construction lab that we just opened half a year ago. Um, so here we have a 
pretty large space with like uh, two new robots, one on a linear axis. So the linear axis is a rail, so the robot can slide on a rail and extend its reach. drone was uh, designed, developed, um, and then built by a student from our iTech master program. Uh, after uh, he finished his project and finished his uh, thesis, he um, is now currently uh, at uh, Autodesk office of CTO at PNI San Francisco as an uh, artist in residence. Long. Yes, okay. Okay, we have 10 minutes more for the lecture. Uh, about 10 more minutes. Can you make it? Yeah, 10, 10 more minutes. Okay. We, start, we started a bit late, I think, yeah, so. Yeah, I know, I know. Okay, go on. Yeah, okay. So, all right, so um, I show you like um, the computational design research at ICD, and you see that we uh, we aim to to ask the fundamental questions about materials, about like fabrication and construction techniques, and about generative techniques. To come up with uh, that I will be better a certain kind of advantage um, over the existing um, construction techniques, for example. So as I say, uh, the computational design trends have been stayed in academia for quite a while. And what industry, uh, like the biggest trend is BIM. Uh, and these two trends have been like um, diverging, uh, well, kind of slightly diverging and have been like been quite isolated. Uh, however, a couple of years ago, um, the, the, the BIM community finally started to pay attention to the computation approaches and this is partly thanks to the emergence of new design platform like um, Dynamo for example. So it's easy to think of uh, Dynamo as just like a grasshopper for Revit but Dynamo is kind of apart from the fact that Dynamo and grasshopper are both a visual scripting um, uh, tool uh, they have no other things in common. Grasshopper is a visual scripting uh, engine that's built on top of, of a freeform curve modeling engine of Rhino, while Dynamo is a generic visual programming language that was integrated in, in a BIM platform so that you can use all of the scripting to query the BIM model rather than just doing geometric modeling like in Rhino, for example. And um, so this is one of the uh, projects that we um, did in 2015, the High Pavilion. So it's a collaboration between uh, ICD and Autodesk. So here we, it's, it's a bit funny in this project because it's an Autodesk project. So like they really want to use Dynamo, but the designers themselves at Autodesk actually prefer to use Crossover because uh, Dynamo was not as developed at that time. It was like in version 0 0.7. Um, and, and eventually move to 0 0.8 when we like about to start the exhibition. Uh, so I was a member of that project and I was responsible to de for developing the, um, the the robot simulations and controlling tool for Dynamo. So uh, we developed the tool to do the inverse kinematic simulation and for robot animation and to generate robot path and the control codes and upload the code directly from Dynamo. So this project aims to like um, questions um, or to like look at the potential of human robot collaboration in constructing a building scale structure. So this this project is like one of the projects that kind of opened up 
the possibility to bring the computational and robotic approach to a BIM environment. Okay, so in the interest of time, I will probably just skip over this very quickly. So <laughs> what you see here is the, 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 the robot path that we study, and we actually did it in, in Grasshopper first. So we prototype everything in Grasshopper because we already have all the in-house uh, robot simulation tool that we developed at ICD uh, for Grasshopper. So we did all the prototype in, in Grasshopper first, and then at the end, we kind of port everything to Dynamo in order to showcase the potential of bringing all of these computational um, design tools to uh, to a BIM environment. So the construction was done live three days at Autodesk University in Las Vegas. Okay, and then um, just three months ago, I started this my, uh, my personal project uh, called Dyna Shape. Um, this is a completely open source and free Dynamo plugin for constraint-based profiling and optimization and physics simulation. It is actually very similar to uh, Kangaroo for Grasshopper. In fact, um, Dynashape and Kangaroo are both based on the same um, theoretical mathematical framework developed by uh, EPFL in Lausanne. Um, so the, um, the original algorithm came from the Competent Graphics Lab. Um, led by uh, Professor Mark Polly at uh, EPFL, which is like a university in Lausanne, uh, Switzerland. So I started this project as like an effort to bring the the computational tool, uh, mostly namely the, the, the constraint base uh, for fighting and optimization that is that has been so familiar uh, in the Grasshopper uh, community and in the computational design community, and, and take this tool and bring them to the uh, BIM community. So, um, for those of you who find, uh, who, who have already used Kangaroo, you find that this tool, uh, many concepts and usages. Uh, you you will find many like uh, familiar concepts and usage uh, with Dynashape. I said that everything now runs natively inside Dynamo, so you can easily integrate it with all the B modeling and all the Revit family, and then you can uh, eventually combine it with other uh, other like Beam tools like the cloud. Uh, like, uh, for example, Project Fractals, which is uh, a cloud-based platform, but taking the Dynamo script and allow you to explore a range of parameters. Okay, so that is something that is not quite possible with, let's say, Kangaroo, for example. But here, by bringing this ability into Dynamo, you can take advantage of the fact that there is, like, a cloud engine there that can take in any Dynamo script and evaluate it in parallel on the cloud platform. So Dynamo is like still in early development and it's relatively still buggy and hard to develop for. Um, generally, Dynamo does not really meant for interaction or real-time updates. So here I have to hack in a lot of uh, features together in order to have a, a like real-time manipulation of geometry. So here you have like custom graphics being drawn in the Dynamo viewport. And everything runs like, like um, really fast in real-time. So even when you have a lot of like uh, spring or notes, um, you can still have like real time feedback for viewport. This is because like uh, I actually hack around uh, the limitation of the periodic update mode, which is equivalent to the support timer update in Grasshopper. Hack around that and draw the geometry directly on the viewport, and that allows the the geometry to be computed and updated and displayed uh, very quickly and efficiently in real time. So you have classic tensor structure explorations. Here um, I have um, uh, the um, deformable plastic object simulation, for example. That is run pretty uh, fast. So this uh, was done using um, a technique called shape matching that allows a very efficient and fast simulation uh, of the formable object. We design with constraint based uh, geometric constraints. So for example, uh, the constraint is that each row, each column of nodes must lies on a circular arc and must maintain equal distance from each other. So as 
the designer manipulate the shape, the solver will move the other nodes around so that the constraints are satisfied. Okay, so as you see, time in order to keep the rows and the columns of nodes uh, co-circular. And the shapes that you get is not something that you explicitly uh, model, but it's something that it emerged from the interaction of the multiple constraints that are usually conflicting with each other. Okay. So, so these kind of techniques are pretty standard and common in, in the classical community or in the computation design community. But now, <coughs> with Dynashape, uh, my hope is to like make it available to the community BIM, uh, to, to the BIM community. And so eventually, uh, my hope is that, you know, uh, the BIM community will start to get out of the standard, like uh, boxy or squarey um, kind of uh, looking uh, architecture and start to have its tool to accept uh, to design more free form uh, geometry that is still like uh, respect certain kind of construction constraint like planarity constraint or uh, equal length constraint, for example. So this tool in Dynashape is completely free and open source. You can find it on GitHub. Um, you can also find a main page uh, on uh, dynamobeam.org. Uh, uh, okay. So uh, that's the end of my talk. Uh, I think we're running over time now, but I'm uh, very happy to stay here for um, for, for Q&A and for the discussion. Long? Yeah. Good. Thank you for uh, for the lecture. You can. I think you can put back your uh, your uh, video now. I still see the the screen. Okay. So we get at least we see you. I mean, here from Barcelona, we have some questions, right? Right. Yeah. I just want to yeah. break a little bit the ice. And say that it's uh, extremely interesting the topic that uh, I mean you introduce you you introduce you showcase with the last pavilion of uh, ICD where you're talking about collaborative robotics. I mean how we can yeah. somehow merge different technology into one unique process of fabrication. You know probably this is the future of uh, the construction sector of architecture. Uh, and it's uh, yeah. also really interesting how we can start to embed basically new forms of knowledge into the construction uh, and the architectural field, like yours, for instance. You said it that you are not an architect, right? Yeah, I'm, I, I was never trained as an architect. Uh, I just got a lot of experience. So that's why it's, it's interesting to me. So working in uh, cross disciplinary research is probably interesting, where you talk to people who have a different idea from you, but like they, they care about the same values and the same principle, and then like you apply your skill to solve the same sort of problem. You think that is relevant to the future of our field. Yeah. I, I can't hear you, Ahmed. Uh, sorry, I can't hear you anymore. It's strange that I can hear the background. Can you hear me? Can you speak closer to the microphone? Talk next to the microphone. Okay, good. Okay. Good. So I was saying that yeah. you couldn't really understand. Uh, I think I lost you again because you move away from the microphone. Okay, can you just repeat slowly what you were uh, saying before? Uh, okay, so um, so I'm actually a computer scientist. I had no formal training in architecture, but I I was brought up in a family where everyone. <laughs> so um, I have a strong interest in visual design architecture. In because being the only scientist there, everybody has a perspective from me. 
okay. and our value. Okay. If we try to bring our skills together to solve the problem, we think it is like, really important to the future of our architecture and construction. Well, I know the story, so I will uh, I will probably talk about it uh, with the students. Um, it's difficult to understand your answer. Probably, are you moving the microphone a little bit while you talk? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can hear you well now, and uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Uh, no. The microphone is pretty close. Okay. 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 Let me see if we have a question from the the students. Okay, and then we can close the lecture yeah. because we have to move to the other class. Yeah, yeah, please. I, I can take like one or two questions. Okay. You, you have to talk from here. You, come here, come first. You... Okay, we're gonna try to make a question. Okay, okay. If you can speak to the microphone, I should be able to hear you. And how it's possible? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Please go on. How it's possible to transfer information from Grasshopper, Grasshopper to Dynamo? Ah, uh, so it's very easy to do a one-way. So the key here is that if you want. Across the Dynamo, everything without number or text. So if you have a lines, it's easy because you only need two points to start and ends, right? And with scripting, you can easily extract the XYZ or Excel file and then look at our debit to read it. Um, so, however, if you want to re update or just the, the geometry is tricky. Normally, it's, it's a one-way street. So, if you want to have a live like synchronizations, what you can do is you have to track of the item between uh, Grasshopper and Dynamo. Because you have to assign an ID number and then the elements and create the same element. No, it's not that you need to solve. No, 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 don't. I mean, it's very difficult to, yeah. to hear you. I don't know why, but during the lecture, it was quite easy to understand you. I know. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? Yeah, somehow, yes. Yeah, we hear you better. Okay. So, can you? Let's okay. Try, so, let's just try to give this. Okay. I this last reply. Okay, I can, I can repeat that. So I was saying that uh, translating the information from Crossover to Dynamo is easy if it's a one-way street. Geometry, and then you translate transfer to Dynamo, and you don't have to like update it again, and it's easy. But whenever you change the geometry from Crossover, you need to like recreate the entire thing in in Dynamo. For example, so it's not that easy. Um, so uh, to have a live synchronization is tricky. However, there are solutions for that. So if you want to do like a synchronization, you can look at this solution, the cloud-based solution called Flux.io. So if you Google Flux.io, um, um, so Flux.io is a cloud-based framework that. I'm between uh, many different design platforms and Dynamo and Revit. But back in 2013, we did not use that workflow. There was not even Dynamo back at that time, so we developed our own workflow, but it really based on XML5. Okay, well, uh, I don't, I'm not sure that we understood everything, or I'm sure that we didn't, we didn't understood probably at all. Uh, <laughs> that's the problem of doing these uh, live conferences. Yeah. The, the, 
the call. But honestly, I mean, thank you for the side. It was a pleasure to have you as a lecturer here, as a speaker for the program. Yeah. And uh, please uh, stay connected with uh, the program that we have given in the next lectures. I want to thank also yeah. I want to thank also all the other nodes that are participating, Mexico, Beirut, and all the others that are connected. So I mean now the next appointment is for Monday. We're well, gonna have another week of global lectures. So from the Yak side and Barcelona, goodbye everyone and see you soon. All right, thank, thank, uh, thank you very much.